We are rolling. You ready? Let's do it. All right, man. So I am. Uh, I'm here with Robbie from Mastering Diabetes. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me, man. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, awesome. Good, good. Yeah, I'm glad to uh, to be connecting with you. I met you back in uh, what was it August at the PCRM event in DC. Yes. And, uh, first time meeting each other, but I've been following you for years, um, which is awesome. I've to... been well aware of your work for years, man. Like we've we've uh, seen each other on the interwebs. It was great to meet in person, and I just love what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, same as well, man. So, for those who might not know about you and your work, I was wondering if you could just kind of give a little bit of about yourself and just uh, introduce yourself to the, the listeners. Yeah. So, a little background. Um, I'm living with type one diabetes. So I was diagnosed when I was 12, just about to turn 13. So I'm living with type 1 for over 19 years. And I started playing around with lots of different diets as a teenager. And eventually, I mean, I'll just cut the story short because people can hear it all over the place. But the bottom line is I started experimenting with many diets. Tried Eventually, I tried a a meat-based diet, um, the Weston A. Price style. And then I ended up trying a plant-based ketogenic diet which was the Gabriel Cousins type of style diet. And being a type 1 diabetic, so people living with type 1 diabetes, our pancreas does not produce sufficient quantities of insulin. So we have to inject insulin. That's the difference between type 1 and prediabetes and type 2. Prediabetes type 2, they produce too much insulin, especially in the beginning. They're over-secreting insulin. It's not a production problem. It's a utilization problem. Now, as a person living with type 1, I inject insulin, I test my blood glucose, and I calculate my carbohydrate consumption. Therefore, it's really easy for all people living with type 1 to measure insulin sensitivity on a day-by-day basis. So insulin's primary function is to take glucose out of the bloodstream into your cells, all right? When that function is compromised, that is when insulin resistance is arising. At that point, when insulin's not able to do that, blood glucose, uh, glucose builds up in the bloodstream, And then you have high blood glucose. And then this is pre-diabetes. This is type 2 diabetes. And for type 1s, it's happening because we're not producing sufficient quantities of insulin. So as a type 1, I can measure my insulin sensitivity. And while I was doing the plant-based ketogenic diet, I would need 3 units of insulin for every 1 gram of carbohydrate I consumed. No, I'm sorry. Every unit of insulin would be able to take three grams of carbohydrate out of my bloodstream into my cells. So it's a three to one ratio. I'd eat 30 grams of uh, carbohydrate per day. I would take about 10 units of insulin, three to one. When I changed my diet to a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, primarily coming from fruits and greens, I have a ratio now of 22 to one. So for every 22 grams of carbohydrate I eat over a 24-hour period, I need one unit of insulin. So it's a significant, significant improvement and insulin sensitivity. And I got really passionate about this topic as I experienced it in my own body. I started doing more and more research. This was over 12 years ago. So I've been following a low-fat plant-based whole food diet for 12 years. And what's amazing is how the connection of insulin resistance affects all forms of diabetes. And I started to learn how This is really the cause of pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So what I saw in my own body, when I reversed insulin resistance, I became very insulin sensitive. I saw that that formula, that way of living, actually solves the problem for pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. It actually reverses it. And we have over 110 million people living with pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes in the U.S. alone. This is, and we literally have the solution. And, and it's what's funny is going back and reading the research on this topic. I mean, we literally knew this going back to 1926. Insulin was invented in 1922. And before then, they had no option but to try a ridiculously low carbohydrate diet. People had very low qualities of life and they would die pretty quickly. It was pretty much a death sentence. Then around 1922, insulin is discovered. Now doctors can start experimenting with more options. Dr. Sansom tried a radical experiment in his paper, and he started giving people more carbohydrate and saw that, wait a minute, they didn't need more insulin. Some of them needed less insulin, and they started feeling better. The diet was cheaper. Their um, cardiovascular health improved. This is 1926. I know. Then in 1927, Dr. Sweeney does an experiment with medical students. 
okay? And he takes groups of medical students, he feeds them four different diets. One diet was fasting, it was just water. One diet was a high protein diet, one was high in fat, and one was higher in carbohydrate. And the carbohydrate diet was a processed crappy diet. We're talking candy, pastries, bread, syrup, all kinds of garbage. And then he did an oral glucose tolerance test on these subjects. And the diet that performed the best was the high carbohydrate one, even though it was processed. So their post-meal blood glucose or their, their blood glucose two hours after the oral glucose tolerance test was in a non-diabetic range. The high fat group and the water group were in the uh, diabetic range. I, I, I mean, it was unbelievable. This is 1927. And then it continues. I mean, there's, I could go on and on and on about the researchers. You had Hemsworth, you had Rabinowitz, Dr. Kempner, Inder Singh. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But the bottom line is, when it comes to diabetes, the conversation that people aren't having enough of is about insulin sensitivity and what is needed to maximize that. And I hope we can talk about it today on, on your podcast. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's such great information and so much to dissect right there. Um, but I kind of want to go a little bit back to your story. You said you've been you've been living with type 1 diabetes since you were a teenager. I'm just curious, like, were you ever given a diagnosis or like, or, or a, a, I should say like a specific cause or something that they suspected may have caused that? Or do you happen to know some of the research out there, different... Um, behaviors that might lead to type 1 diabetes? Yeah, so when I was diagnosed, the doctors did not say, hey, this caused it. You know, the, the typical teaching right now is that it's an autoimmune condition and we don't really know what causes it. That's really, that's standard. Now there is research pointing towards cow's milk being a problem in type 1 diabetes. And the theory there is that there's a protein in cow's milk that's very similar to a protein in uh, beta cells. So the body gets confused, so it attacks, it thinks it's attacking a foreign object when it's actually attacking itself. It's called molecular mimicry. That's a theory. Um, we, that's not really proven. Um, and I think there's a lot of question around that. Uh, there's a best-selling author right now, very popular guy named Anthony William, the medical medium. He's uh, written several books. He has people doing celery juice, He's changing a lot of lives. And he has brought the idea to the table that the body doesn't attack itself. And that the reason somebody living with type 1 diabetes has antibodies is because the antibodies are fighting a virus or a pathogen that is doing the damage. That it's not the body getting confused. And I think that's an interesting insight. Um, I ch honestly choose to believe it. I can't prove it. There's no like science behind that. But I, I think that, uh, that he's on to something there. And um, it's just sort of a personal choice to sort of think that way and then open up the mindset. Okay, wait a minute. If my body's not attacking itself, then maybe there is a chance for healing here. And, you know, I know you asked about the cause of, of type 1 diabetes, but it leads me into a topic I'm very passionate about, which is the idea of reversing type 1 diabetes. So, I mean, that's really actually what got me into deciding to pursue these, all these different diets that I tried and end up landing where I am now. And it, over 12 years of sort of looking into this, doing research, trying to understand what's going on here, I realized it's, it's a two-pronged issue. So to reverse type 1 diabetes, the first thing we have to solve is why we have antibodies, why we have these elevated antibodies. There's about six particular ones, GAD, is uh, the most prominent, IA2 is prominent. But we, as a type one community, have to understand why we have these antibodies and how can we lower them. That's step one. So once we can figure that out, and these, you know, either the pathogens aren't doing the damage or the antibodies aren't doing the damage, whatever it is, then step two is to figure out how can we get beta cells working again? How can we produce new beta cells or would we have to inject them via, you know, via stem cells or whatever? And uh, that's how that problem has got to be solved. So I think we have a lot of effort and research going around talking mostly about the beta cells and all that. But I don't know if there's a big enough focus on figuring out the uh, antibody situation and seeing antibodies come down and really not exist. That's step one. So just want to throw that out there for anybody listening who's in interested in that topic. We as a community... We got to think about this together. We got to put our minds on it together. And 
you know, I always think you look back in history, uh, you know, so many times when people thought they knew everything and then they were proven incorrect. Like what we think we know everything right now, we think we know so much, but history has factually shown us that in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, things we think we know are correct right now will be proven otherwise. So we're just trying to figure this out. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great saying right there. It's like you should never be stuck on one idea and you should be open to many theories and possibilities. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I've looked into type 2 diabetes and there's just so much overwhelming research saying that, you know, like for example, plant-based diet can reverse it for, for good. With your experience and, and I'm sure you work with a lot of people and you know a lot of people with type 1, have you ever seen like type 1 go away, be reversed? Or is it just something that you can really manage quite well on a plant-based diet instead? Okay, so this is a great question. Um, there are some, some outliers or some intriguing situations. Um, but in general, the answer is we don't have a repeatable, reliable solution for reversing type 1 diabetes. Now, um, there are some intriguing examples, you know, I mean, in our 2017 Mastering Diabetes Online Summit, Dr. Joel Furman said in that interview, publicly sharing, that he has had, uh, I think he said two people who came to him, they were just diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, he changed their diet, and he, those people were able to stay off of insulin. Now, again, I don't know those, the details of the numbers, those stories haven't been published, but my gut tells me what happened there is they changed their lifestyle quick enough where they could preserve a, enough beta cell function, that they produce enough insulin to stay off. And he did say in the interview, like if somebody gets sick or something, their blood glucose gets a little wonky and they might need a little bit of insulin. So that's a sign that they really don't have full capacity. But it really comes down to a lot of nuances here about um, really the difference between type 1 diabetes and type 1.5 diabetes. And what it comes down to is, how much damage has been done to the beta cells? How much insulin are you capable of producing internally? And so type 1.5 diabetes is a slow onset. It's a, it's a latent LIDA, but they call it latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. All right. So again, this is, we don't really fully understand why this is happening or how it's happening, but the way researchers have explained it is that it's, beta cell destruction happening at a very slow rate. So those people can have a little bit of insulin production, enough insulin production to stay off of medications. But over the time, over years, 5, 10, 15 years, a lot of times these people do become insulin dependent. Now, this brings up a really important topic, which is the C-peptide test. If anybody's listening to this and they, they have diabetes and they're trying to figure out what to do, the C-peptide test is one of the most important tests you can possibly get. It's more important than an A1C test. And what it tells you is how much insulin your body is producing. And when you have that information, you can set your expectations for what's going to happen when you follow a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet. And so C-peptide is produced in a one-to-one -one ratio with insulin. So when your body produces insulin, it also produces C-peptide. Then they break off. C-peptide sort of floats around, doesn't do anything, but it's easy to measure in the blood as an indicator of how much insulin you're producing. So do that C-peptide test. Uh, you can do a fasting C-peptide. You can do a stimulated C-peptide. We have an article on our website with all the details about the numbers and the ranges. But what happens is people get that test and you'll see if you're high, if that C-peptide is very high, this means you have plenty of insulin, all, your body's producing plenty of its own insulin, and now all you gotta do is optimize your insulin sensitivity and you can get rid of diabetes. If it's in the medium to low range, now we start to recalibrate the expectations. Maybe you do have enough endogenous insulin, maybe you don't. So people can be living with type two diabetes, but be considered an insulin dependent type, type two. And that is because they've had type two diabetes for so long that their pancreas is exhausted. They don't have any antibodies, so there's no autoimmune activity detected. They just have an exhausted pancreas. Beta cells aren't producing enough insulin. And in that case, it's okay if you need a little bit of insulin. Insulin's not the enemy. Insulin does not lead to weight gain in the context of a healthy diet. All we're trying to do is only inject the same amount of insulin our pancreas would have normally secreted before it was damaged. So if you're a type two, your pancreas is exhausted, you're not producing enough. If you're a type one, 
you've had your beta cells damaged, type 1.5, same situation. Insulin is not the enemy. Insulin is a, a necessary, required hormone. We just want to inject the same amount your pancreas was producing before it was damaged. Okay, got it. That's really good that you mentioned that test because I know I'm aware of the A1C test and that's very commonly pr promoted. Um, that's good to have that as an option as well, the C-peptide test. Um, and it's very inexpensive. People can go to requestatest.com and you can buy it from LabCorp or Quest. And you don't need your doctor's prescription. You don't need to go through any of that hassle. And it's, I think it's $49, maybe even $39. It, it's very right. reasonable for the information it's, it's going to provide is worth every penny. You know, this is for somebody who's – a lot of times we see so many people at our Mastering Diabetes program come to us and say, look, I'm doing the diet and I'm not seeing the great results. And every time, invariably, that person has a low C-peptide – is not producing enough of their own insulin, and then they learn that, okay, if I wanna follow this healthy diet, I'm gonna have to use some insulin. Got it, got it. Um, and so people should take that test and go to their doctors. I mean, just the one thing I'm a huge fan of is using doctors on demand. So doctors on demand, telemedicine is the future, okay? People will very rarely be going to a doctor's office and seeing their doctor. They're gonna be doing it via their phone, or their computer, or their tablet, and everything's gonna happen digitally. Well, so, what was that, we uh, have a I'm sorry, what was that link? You, that, that, yeah, uh, so it's called, it's called Doctors On Demand, and there's one doctor there, Lori, so he, it's a little, a little bit of a hack here, all right? So, the purpose of the software is to help people in urgent situations, so literally, if you if something's going on and you want a doctor, you can talk to somebody in 15 minutes, like immediately. Now, we have a friend, Dr. Lori Marbus, who is one of the best plant-based doctors we are aware of. She happens to just work for them just as part of her career. So she does those regular appointments with random people who need you know, an urgent doctor. But we can sort of hack the service where you get to sign up with her because you want plant-based information, because you want her to interpret your C-peptide result, because you want her to change your medication. She's covered in, I believe, 14 different states. This is all on our website. You can just Google Lori Marbus Mastering Diabetes. You can put this in the show notes, and all the states are listed. And people can literally get an appointment with one of the best doctors in all the land in less than 48 hours. It's unbelievable. If people want to see an endocrinologist, it usually takes six to nine months, and it's, they're not even good. And this is a fantastic experience. You, insurance might cover it. Um, if your insurance doesn't cover it, it's $75 for a 15 minutes appointment. And you will type in everything that's going on before you meet with Lori. So you'll put in your, your blood work, you'll put in your, what's going on, and she will actually read it and see it. You know, if you go to a regular doctor, usually that happens with the receptionist, that happens over the phone, and then the doctor sees it literally like for 30 seconds before they sit down and talk to you. Lori's going to read it before the appointment. She's going to come in prepared, and, and you're going to get a lot out of that 15-minute appointment. I mean, it truly is the future of medicine. Um, we send a lot of our clients there, and they have a fascinating experience, you know, a very helpful experience with Dr. Marbus, and it's very efficient. I agree. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for dropping those resources. I'll definitely have them in the show notes below. Um, Let's let's talk a little bit about insulin because you've brought that up quite a few times. Yeah. Um, I, I guess what I want to ask you is, um, you know, there's different forms of insulin obviously out there, um, different brands. Uh, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that because I've never talked to anyone with type 1. So anybody who's yeah. out there with type 1 could relate to this? For sure. Great question. So when it comes to injecting insulin for people living with insulin-dependent diabetes. Again, this could be type 1, could be type 1.5, could be type 2. There are basically, there's two types. There's the basal and the bolus insulin. So the basal insulin is the insulin that's going to drip 24 hours a day. You need a little bit of insulin all throughout the day. And then you need a bolus when you eat a meal. When you eat a significant amount of carbohydrate, that's when your body needs a larger amount of insulin in order to take that glucose out of the bloodstream and into your cells. So if somebody's using an insulin pump, they use, so, okay, so there's the basal, there's the bolus. Now there's also um, bolus insulin is considered, is usually like 
considered fa- it's fast acting insulin. And this could, could get a little confusing. There's a lot of nuances here. Now, but put it this way. If you're using an insulin pump, you use fast acting insulin, the same type all day long. So the, you, know, you, can have, you can have a wireless pump or you can have a pump that has a wire, either one. They have both these days. And so that pump will drip insulin and that'll be your basal. And then when you eat a meal, you'll, you'll bolus. And that insulin in there will be usually like Novolog or Humalog, something like that. Those are the types, of, you know, popular types. Now, if you're doing injections, you will inject long-acting insulin such as Lantus or Baziglar. Um, there's Tugeo. Um, there's one called Levomir, which we actually don't like. I'll tell you why in a second. And there's one other one I'm forgetting. But these insulins, you inject, like, for example, Lantus insulin. Okay, and if I... I used to use Lantus. That was very, very popular. And then insurance really stopped covering it. And now we all, a lot of us take Baziglar. It's like an alternative version. You know? um, and I'll inject that. And it forms a crystal immediately. And then it starts to dissolve slowly over the course of 24 hours. And so that's what you call a uh, long-acting insulin that is used to manage my blood glucose all throughout the day. Now, the reason we don't like Levomir is because Levomir works for roughly like 17 hours. So when you decide to do your next injection, there's like this little bit of lag time. And sometimes people will inject it twice, once in the morning, once at night. And then there's this overlap. It's very confusing. It's much better to use a 24-hour insulin like Lantus, like Baziglar, inject it once, let it run its course, and then inject it. So you're going to try and you want it. It's important to inject that insulin at the same time every day. And then for um, you know, a bolus, a fast-acting insulin will be used. So for me, I use Humalog or Novolog. I can use both interchangeably. And that works when you eat a meal. So it's a great topic you're bringing up, and I, I love talking about these nuances. I hope the audience appreciates it. Um, living with insulin-dependent diabetes, it, when you think about it in a meta perspective, it's a fascinating game. It's a fascinating <laughs> game of, of trying to calculate that insulin properly based on how much food you're eating and all the factors involved, how much activity you've been doing, how stressed you are, did you eat a little bit more fat the day before, all this stuff factors in. Whereas somebody like you, you know, somebody who doesn't have a damaged pancreas, your body is doing this perfectly in this infinite wisdom and you have different phases of insulin. So you have insulin that's ready to go. The moment you eat food, your body doesn't need to rapidly produce insulin right then and there. It already has insulin ready to fire, just sitting there ready to go, and that'll keep your blood glucose steady. And then it will produce a little bit more because it knows you just ate a lot. And this is a, and it, it's always doing that. It's always on top of this for you. And then for us, like, man, when you think about it, it, it it's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that we ever get it right. It's that the fact that we as type ones sit down, eat a meal, it doesn't matter how many grams of carbohydrate are there, and then f- calculate the insulin. And then you also can factor in the, uh, the, the, the fact that not every amount of the insulin is absorbed. Like there's absorption right. issues. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and then it's, just, and it's also fun to think about how small the molecules are, mm. yet how powerful they are. So when I inject insulin, it's a very small amount. But most of that is is filler. It's like water. It's not actually active insulin is a small amount of that drop. So the whole thing is very interesting. We're certainly uh, lucky that insulin has been discovered and that it exists. So um, I'm grateful for insulin right now. That is very interesting. You brought all that up because, like, I guess someone like me, I never even like thought about all that. It's sure. really. Um, it is a miracle. It really is. And yeah. the fact, like, we're we're living in the best time ever to be able we to have something like that to, like, increases people's quality of life. That's yes. amazing. I love that. Um, uh, the other part of my question to, like, the um, insulin one was, like, how about monitoring glucose levels? Do you yeah. do that? Do you recommend people do that? Okay. So we have more amazing modern technology here. There. Uh, in the past, I would say, five or so years, continuous glucose monitors have become much more popular and much more accessible. So a continuous glucose monitor will provide blood glucose readings every five minutes. 
And so there's the, the primary ones. There's several companies, but the most popular are Dexcom and Freestyle Libre. And both, both of these are a Bluetooth device that is actually the Freestyle Libre, I'm not sure, is Bluetooth. They're going to add Bluetooth soon. I know that's part of their uh, roadmap. But it's a wireless device, put it that way. And it is inserted under, like, the, the, the needle measures interstitial fluid. So you inject it, and, like, it's attached on top of your skin. Like, you can see it. But what it's doing is that when you insert it, it's inserting this very thin, pliable needle into your skin to measure interstitial fluid. It's not actually measuring blood. So continuous glucose monitors are actually about 15 minutes delayed. They're, the data that they're providing is not an actual blood glucose reading in that very moment. So that's why it's a little bit different than actually pricking yourself and testing blood. But these devices are game changing. It's, it's, it's really nice. Now, I will say there is yet to be convincing peer-reviewed studies that actually show a change in diabetic outcomes based on continuous glucose monitors. This is something Dr. McDougall likes to talk about. He, you know, he likes to sort of rip on them a little bit and rip on the medical companies making money off of people and all that stuff, especially for type 2s. You know, type 2s using these devices rather than just getting rid of the condition, that's a little frustrating. I see where Dr. McDougall is coming from there. But I think he's, he's making a valid point when he says that, hey, look, these devices don't, aren't necessarily going to change your diabetes outcomes. It's lifestyle. It's dietary changes. That's going to change your, your health and your outcome, not these, not these monitors. But with that said, as a person living with type 1 diabetes, I could say it hasn't improved my A1C. It hasn't made it worse or better. That, it's, my, it's other factors that affect that. But my quality of life and the ability to sort of have that data, to not have to prick myself, you have a little bit more of a peace of mind when you go to sleep at night. Because part of the dangers of being an insulin-dependent diabetic is that you could go low at night and that could kill you. So when you have a device that will beep and wake you up if something like that happens or wake up a loved one, it's pretty cool. I mean, especially for young children, uh, these devices can talk to parents, talk to loved ones, family members. So a kid could be at school wearing their continuous glucose monitor and the parent can get their blood glucose, see that their child's blood glucose on their eye watch on their wrist i mean that's pretty cool technology i mean Absolutely. in this in this world and this reality this situation that we have um cgms are, are are really really valuable yeah that's awesome that, that's really cool to know that stuff um i could see yeah i could see one side of dr mcdougall but if you're talking about people who are dependent on it you want that peace of mind you know you want to yeah. know that your blood glucose levels are where they need to be and i will add like it, it's provided a lot of fun data <laughs> for me. I mean, as be, I've been doing this for over 12 years now. I've probably been wearing a CGM for, I don't know, maybe maybe three years. I don't even know. I'd have to think about it. But um, I, for all the years, I didn't really know after I ate a meal, what was the blood glucose curve? How high was it going? How was it coming down? Like what happens when I add a bunch of arugula or if I don't add arugula or if I add cauliflower to the meal or how does jackfruit – impact my blood glucose differently than blueberries. I mean, it's, it's kind of fun. It's interesting. So, yeah. No, I'm sure yeah. you've learned a lot from your body. I'm actually really nerdy about stuff like that too. Like I monitor my calories and my nutrients that I get every day. And I'm, I was scared to admit it, but I, 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 pretty, I love seeing the numbers and like how like I fluctuate throughout the year and stuff. I think it's really cool. So that's, that's great, man. I totally relate. Um, mm -hmm. But I do want to talk to you a little bit about the diet. I mean, <laughs> if I was like a standard doctor or even a dietitian right now um, and look at those fruit behind you, I would freak out and be like, oh my gosh, you have diabetes and you have all that fruit. So t mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about carbohydrates and fruits and yeah. how that may or may not affect diabetes in a bad way. Absolutely. So I want to take it back to the conversation about insulin resistance. Let's start there. So the actual cause of insulin resistance, there's, there's many causes. You could, you know, advance glycation end products, you know, it's inflammation, you know, heme iron. There's, there's a lot of nuanced things that can cause cell disruption and cause insulin not to work properly. But the leading, leading cause, the biggest issue that we know for sure with insulin resistance 
is consuming a diet too high in fat. When you eat too much fat, your body ends up storing that fat in tissues that are not designed to store fat. So your muscle and liver cells end up storing fat. They're not supposed to, they're supposed to store small amounts of fat, but not large amounts. Adipose tissue is where fat is supposed to be stored. So when you consume too much and fat accumulates in the muscle and liver cells, insulin does not work properly. It's essentially gumming the lock. The ability for insulin to open the door and let glucose out of the bloodstream into the cells is inhibited. And this has been shown over and over and over again. You know, we talked earlier about the research of Dr. Sweeney in 1927. This is done over and over and over again. There's a study um, that Dr. Hemsworth did from the UK in 1935. He did seven different diets, ranging from 13% of calories from fat to 80% of calories from fat. And he showed all along the way, there was a proportional difference in insulin sensitivity all the way down at every step of the way 13 percent of calories from fat had the highest level of insulin sensitivity you can see these on these graphs that he has where he injected insulin and then would see how fast did the insulin work and how low did it take their blood glucose and you, the graphs are very powerful when you get a chance to see them maybe i'll put a link in the show notes or something but um this has been shown over and over again that when you follow a low-fat diet insulin resistance is reversed. Now, there's another example here I'd like to talk about is Dr. Kempner. Dr. Walter Kempner fed people what he called the rice fruit diet. This is they literally fed people nothing but rice, fruit, fruit juice, and white sugar. This diet was 2% of calories from fat. Here's a chart in one of his studies explaining the composition of the diet. Literally, they would consume five grams of fat per day, which ended up being 2% of calories from fat. It was over 565 grams of carbohydrate per day coming from those refined foods, mostly refined foods. It wasn't, it wasn't like a lot of whole fruit. It was mostly white rice. Right. Okay. And he saw people improve their diabetes health. Now, he initially had designed it for hypertension, and he was even skeptical what would happen when people with diabetes started following this diet. And he saw improvements. He saw people getting off insulin. He saw people losing weight. This is, again, mind-blowing to most people, but the research is very clear. A low-fat diet improves insulin sensitivity. So when you look at my uh, fruit behind me here, you're like, wow, how can a person living with diabetes eat a lot of fruit? The bottom line is the reason I can eat fruit and have you know, a stable weight, control my blood glucose, use very normal amounts of insulin, healthy amounts of insulin, is because I'm following a low-fat diet. It, that's the bottom line. If I was trying to eat all this fruit and I was also eating a lot of fat, I was eating lots of avocado, lots of coconut meat, then it would be a metabolic disaster. No question about it. So fruit is particularly beneficial, you know, because I'm not just fruit. I mean whole plant foods. So we're talking, we have a green light, yellow light, red light food system. The green light food system includes the, the four calorie providing foods are categories of food, are fruits, starchy vegetables, that's like potatoes, um, butternut squash, then we have uh, legumes, then we have intact whole grains. All these foods, again, intact being the key word for whole grains, they're not refined. They can include loads of water, loads of fiber, and loads of nutrients, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytochemicals. And when you have this package, you see incredible results in overall health. And because there's not too much fat inside our cells, insulin's working properly, and you're eating these foods with, a low, with all the fiber, which like slows down absorption, then you see steady blood glucose. You see people reversing prediabetes, reversing type 2 diabetes, and people like myself. Again, I mean, if anybody knows numbers, I mean, I'll eat a meal of over 200 grams of carbohydrate and inject, you know, six and a half units of insulin. So my, my mealtime ratios... My mealtime meal bolus is about 30 to 1. That's the minimum. As the day goes on, it improves maybe 40, 45, 50. People living with type 1 diabetes, they're injecting at 5 to 1, 10 to 1. So a meal that I'm injecting 7 units of insulin, 6 units of insulin, they would need 40 if they tried to eat that much. And it's, it's mind-boggling to them. But the changes happen rapidly. So for a person living with type 1, they can increase their carbohydrate consumption, reduce their insulin needs, in literally a day. 
I mean, if it doesn't happen on day one, it's going to happen on day two. No question. This happened. We have we run four day retreats, and we've never seen a single person come and not improve their insulin sensitivity within the four day period. It happens every time. And the same thing with people living with type two diabetes. You'll see them increasing their carbohydrate consumption, needing even if they need the same amount of medication. We are still showing an improvement in insulin sensitivity in the short term because they're eating way more carbohydrate and they're not needing more medication. That means something is going on in order for that carbohydrate not to raise their blood glucose more and get in their blood and get into their uh, their cells. Improved insulin sensitivity. So then, obviously, as they begin to stop taking medications and see their fasting blood glucose lower and see their A1C lower, then again we've reversed the cause of the of the disease, which is insulin resistance. And at that point, we know that their endogenous insulin is working more efficiently. It's able to handle this large amount of carbohydrate consumption, and now they have excellent blood glucose. And the fun part is that we fix a lot more than just blood glucose. You know, fatty liver disease reversed, chronic kidney disease reversed, you know, lipid profile improves dramatically. Blind, I mean, not blindness, but neuropathy, uh, retinopathy. I mean, these are all things that uh, we've seen our clients reverse on our program. Absolutely. I mean, diabetes is one of those diseases which can take many paths after that. Like you said, cardiovascular problems, nerve problems, so many things can go wrong. And I think managing it and what you're doing is is amazing. It's, it's crucial for people that have diabetes. Now... Um, Talk to me a little bit about mastering diabetes for somebody who just may have found out they're diagnosed with type 1, type 2, type 1 and a half. Uh, they're kind of lost. They don't know what to do. Tell me about your program and what services you guys offer. Okay, so Mastering Diabetes is uh, an organization that I co-founded with Cyrus Kambata, who is also living with type 1 diabetes. And he's just a brilliant guy. It's so much fun what we're doing together. He's, um, he's actually uh, got a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from UC Berkeley. Really, really smart guy. He loves to talk about the science of insulin resistance, and he's published a lot of papers on the topic. So he's really cool. Um, so we do it together, and we created an online coaching program, which we are super, super proud of. And it has three different tools. The first tool is an online course. So the online course helps people transition from their current diet to a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet one step at a time. We are super passionate about making the transition very graceful and manageable. People try and bite off more than they can chew, and then they end up stepping back, and it becomes frustrating. We want it to be a slow, steady, healthy progression. And there's actually research coming out these days showing that that's the preferred way to do it for gut health in a lot of cases. So this can prevent a lot of struggles that some people run into when trying to make too much change too quickly. So the online course walks people through all the nuances, what to eat, how to manage blood glucose with during, before, during, and after exercise, how to talk to your doctor, what tests to get, you know, recipe ideas, meal planning ideas, meal tips, shopping tips, all the nuances, everything you can think of that you would need to know to make the transition all laid out in a very intentional step-by-step manner. So people start out by just changing breakfast. And that's the online course. Then we provide community support. So this can be done through Facebook or through the online course if somebody's not a Facebook user. And this is where you can get a lot of help through our community, through other people who've been through the same transition you've been through. It's really priceless. If somebody just comes in and they're like, hey, I'm taking 2,000 milligrams of metformin. When do I, how do I know when to drop it? And then somebody pops in and says, hey, I was in the same situation. I went from 2,000 to 1,000 in two weeks. And then uh, three weeks later, I stopped taking metformin. And now my A1C is 5.0. Now I'm taking any medic. You know, that encouragement, that uh, support means the world. And somebody's having a bad day, like, oh, man, I, I know I'm supposed to do this. And I, I fell off the wagon. And I just, I'm, I'm ready to get back on. And people flood that stream like oh don't worry about it it's okay i same thing happened to me and i'm doing great now like focus on the bigger picture so you get that community support but most importantly we have our coaches in there so we have two three coaches in our coaching program right now adam sud and mark ramirez are people who have both reversed type 2 diabetes themselves kylie buckner 
is a registered nurse with over 20 years experience working with people and a lot of work with di- people living with diabetes. She happens to be Cyrus's wife, so she has a lot of knowledge about type 1 diabetes. And our three coaches respond to all posts that have been made within 24 hours. So it's step by step. We are there for you. That is the community aspect. And we also do challenges. So there's recipe challenges going on. There's group intermittent fasts. So we kind of do it together. It's just a really interactive, fun experience. Then the third tool we have is a twice monthly live Q&A call. So this is a chance for the people, the members of our group to interact directly with our coaches. It's done via a video conference and you get to ask questions in person there with the coaches. So that ability to talk and connect and sort of see face to face sort of also enhances what then goes on in the community forum when we're writing back and forth. Once you sort of made that connection, it's really nice. So that's the first and third Sunday of every month. People come and join that video call so we can see each other or you could just call with your phone. Either one works. And that's the program. That's the main thing we do at Mastering Diabetes. Uh, I had a lot of fun working at Forks Over Knives for six years and launching and building that. And the one thing that I thought was missing was an opportunity for people to get direct coaching at an affordable price. There just wasn't a resource. If you're living with diabetes and you're like, okay, I'm going to do a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, there was not one place to go to get really good, detailed, nuanced diabetes information. The great questions that you asked today about insulin, insulin type, insulin timing, C-peptide test, how to intermittent fast with diabetes and diabetes medications. There's just a litany of nuances and nobody was addressing those and and having a safe place for people to go. And that's why we created Mastering Diabetes and the coaching allows that support, that day-to-day support. And we also, we provide education. We provide a lot of free education. We do online summits. We're just launching our third summit this year. Um, We do great blog posts, YouTube videos. We have a podcast, education on Instagram, and we do retreats. We do um, in-person retreats about two to three a year. Our one in Costa Rica is just about to sell out. Really excited about that. And so we're having a lot of fun at Master RBs. We also have a book coming out uh, with Penguin Random House in early 2020. So we're super pumped about that. And we just really appreciate you know, people like you and all the support uh, of sharing this message because we, it's David versus Goliath right now. What's going on in the diabetes world of people being scared of carbohydrates, scared of fruit, scared of whole grains, scared of beans, scared of rice. And it is truly unwarranted. Like there is clear evidence-based research showing that these foods are actually the solution and we're just trying to get that information out and then have people implement it in their lives. So, you know, anybody listening to this who decides to share this podcast with a friend who is they know, just be like, hey, like, check it out. Like, that means the world to us. That is how this information is going to spread and this information is going to reach more people is people doing the work that you're doing and, you know, the people listening, actually sharing this information, sending an email, talking to a, uh, a friend about it. That's how we're going to change this world. Yeah, absolutely. It's it really does come down to community, and it sounds like that's what mastering diabetes is. Plus, of course, the services you provide. But that community aspect is what really makes the change. So that's awesome, man. And congratulate you guys on your success and keep up the good work. Um, Robbie, any final thoughts? Anything uh, last minute thing you want to share with the audience? Yeah. Um, the final thought is, I really, really want anybody who's listening to this. If you've gotten to this point in the episode and you're with us, I just implore you to to do it. Like make some changes no matter where you're at. Like we are all in this together. There's always room for improvement. Like let's do it. Don't make this be just like another show of entertainment or whatever. Like actually put something into action. Eat some more fruit or, or share this with a friend and see if you can maybe impact their life or lead by example so your friend will do it. Um, but I just want people to put this up into action. Like nothing makes me happier than you know getting an Instagram DM or publishing a testimonial of somebody saying, I put this into action and, and here's what happened. You know, I reversed my diabetes. I'm, I'm living with type one. It's the first time I'm ever in control and my A1C is the best it's ever been. Like that stuff, like 
that's that's it. Like that's what life that's is the about. Magic, man. Yes. There's nothing better than that. Yes. There's nothing better than that. So, uh, you know, it's and for us, it's just like a win-win situation. You know, people come in our coaching program. All we want to do is get more people in and and get them to see the results. Like it's just, I want you to feel the best you've ever felt, and then I want to tell people that you feel amazing. Like that's that's what's going on here. That's, so, uh, yeah. like, let's do this and. Use the resources. I mean, we have a free Facebook group. If you want to go join that, just type in Mastering Diabetes into Facebook. We have a group. You'll get a lot of great support in there. It's well monitored. Like we monitor every post before it goes up. So it's a good, safe place. And um, like utilize your resources. I know you put out great videos. Like I'm sure pe- people DM you. You, you help them out. Um, do you do coaching? No, uh, so I kind of actually wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, but I actually have been thinking of doing uh, like as much as I can just to help as many people. Some people prefer that one-on-one coaching yeah. as I'm sure you're. Perfect. Listen, if you listen to this, you're a regular listener of this guy's amazing content and you're ready for some coaching, DM <laughs> him and tell him I'm ready. You know what I mean? Like, like do it. I'm telling you, we all need coaches. I mean, everybody, I, it yeah. doesn't matter. Like, uh, you know, Roger Federer yeah. has a coach. You know, I mean, the greatest people, I don't, even the best business investors, whatever, you know, right. anybody at a top level has a coach and they help take them to the next level. So if you have yeah. health goals and you want something to, to, to change, you want a different result, hiring a coach is a very, very good investment. It takes things to the next level, brings a certain amount of accountability. You get some wisdom, some advice. Do it, man. Absolutely yeah. do it. So... Right That's on, it. My, you asked what my final words were, and it's just like I'm imploring people to take action. Like, do yeah. it. Make something happen. Like, let this show be the uh, the start of something special. Yeah, yeah. Take it more than just the idea and put it into action. I couldn't have said it better myself, man. Robbie, it was a pleasure having you on, man, and talking to you about type 1, type 2, because this is something I've never done before. So really hope the people out there connect with you and your, uh, and, and your work. And um, welcome back anytime, man. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it.